Amen. In Ephesians chapter 5, I'd like to draw your attention here in the Word of God to verse number 18. Verse number 18, the Bible reads, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. I want to point out that this is a commandment from God. Once you're saved, you must choose to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, look at the next verse. It says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. He says, you need to speak to yourself and your inner man. You need to have the Word of God in your heart. So you can let the Word of God speak to you through the Holy Spirit, being filled with God's Holy Spirit. We are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you would, go to John chapter 14, please. John chapter number 14. We uh, have a theme every month. I have asked the Lord to help me to uh, do everything decently in order in our church. And I have asked for uh, the Lord's leading and guiding for a theme for every month of the year. We've been doing this for a few years now. And this month, the focus of our year now is truth. The focus of this month is spiritual truth. And we're going to talk about some of the truths of the Holy Spirit for the duration of the month. And I just want you to ask this, ask this question to yourself, how much do you really know about the Holy Ghost? What do you know about the Holy Spirit? If there is any character in the Bible that uh, doesn't get as much mention, perhaps it would be the Holy Spirit. We certainly speak of the Father in abundance. And we certainly speak of the Son in great volume. But what of God's Holy Spirit? Now in John chapter 14, look at verse number 16. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I want to ask you this question. Do you know the spirit of truth? There are people out there that are completely deceived. They don't know truth from lies. They don't have the spirit of truth dwelling inside of them. He drives this point home in this verse. He says, the world cannot receive. Be Look at it in verse 17. The world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. What a promise. God is saying the Holy Spirit is going to abide in you. Notice that at the end of verse 16, that he will abide in you. God says, I'm going to make my abode with you. I'm going to live inside of man. The world can't see him. They can't recognize him. They don't understand him. You say, why? Well, because they have rejected Jesus as God and Savior. The lost and dying world that does not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is the only way to be saved, they do not have the Spirit of truth. There are many that claim to be a prophet that have a lying spirit, or they are deceived by an unclean spirit. But this is different. This is God's spirit living inside of you. He wants to work in you. Listen, uh, spiritual growth is measured only in one way, and that's how much you decide to yield your body and your life to the spirit of truth. How much of your mind do you want God to have? And unfortunately in our lives, we really enjoy the things of the flesh, don't we? The, the things that are not of the Father, as it says, right? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We get distracted by the cares of this world, and we're not submitting our life to God, and we don't grow spiritually because we're caught up in what we want. Spiritual growth is measured in only one way, and it's this. How much of your life 
Have you yielded to the Spirit of truth? How many things in your life are you willing to say, God, whatever the truth is, I want to know. Whatever you want me to do, even if it's not what I want to hear, I want the truth. I want it from the Holy Spirit. I want to make sure that I'm standing on a firm foundation and not my own opinion and not my selfish desire. How much of your mind have you yielded to the Holy Spirit? How much of your heart, how much of your life, how much of your hands and your eyes and your feet and your tongue and so on have you completely given to God? That's how we can internally begin to measure our spiritual growth is when we grow up enough to stop being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, to stop being childish in how we approach this life being distracted by the cares of the world. This is such a beautiful promise that the Holy Spirit will indwell us. I mean, this is awesome. This is God's power inside of us, the ability of His love to work through us. That is the evidence that people will see. They say, man, I felt the love of God talking to them. That's what God wants with us. He says at the end of verse 16 that He will abide with you uh, until you sin again. Is that, is that what your Bible says? What does it say? Forever. Does it say forever? Does God mean forever? Yes, He does. I want you to understand the eternal security of the believer has nothing to do with your good lifestyle. It has everything to do with the power of God. He will lose none of those that are His. No man will pluck you out of His hand. He will in no wise cast you out. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 10, he says, once and for all, it's done, it's finished. Not because of my works of righteousness, because of his mercy, he saves us. Amen. God is so good, he loves us, and he wants us to be saved, but then he, he makes it easy to be saved, but then he doesn't require you to have this big burden of living a perfect life to keep your salvation. Can you imagine if somebody that struggled with drugs or drinking or fornication, whatever it is, and you say, well, if you don't get rid of that stuff, then you're not really saved. Well, I thought Jesus died for all of my sins. He either died for all of your sins or you think you can lose your salvation. I ask you, do you know the spirit of truth? Here it says the world cannot know him. So I ask you, do you know the spirit of truth. If so, he's with you forever. I want to give you a few points, just facts about the Holy Spirit. As we, we kick, we're kicking off a month, we're going to learn as much as we can about the Holy Spirit, how he works, what he wants from us, and what we can see through that. I want to start by identifying, first of all, that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a standalone person, uh, for lack of a better term, but it's a Bible word. If you would go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. This is essential and important because there are those that say, well, the Holy Spirit is just a force or some power. No, 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 no. I want you to understand this is the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Uh, in Genesis 1 verse 2, it tells us that we see the Spirit of the God moving. Right away in the first chapter, second verse, we see the Spirit of God. He has many names, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the living God, the Spirit of the Lord, the free Spirit, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of burning. There are some really amazing statements, the Holy Ghost, the, the Spirit of grace, He's also called. He is called the Comforter. Now, the Holy Spirit is usually mentioned, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. In Matthew 28, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now we typically see the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth mentioned lastly because Jesus came and then He sent the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. You're in 2 Corinthians 13. Go to the very end of that chapter. Look at verse 14. 2 Corinthians 13, verse number 14 the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. We see all three again identified here and listed. 
Uh, go to John chapter 15, please. Go to John chapter 15. Being the third person of the Trinity does not indicate in any way that he is inferior. That is just typically the order of how the Lord presents himself. We know that in 1 John 5, 7, it says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. These three are one. You say one what? Well, it's one God. In the same way that in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, it says that we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. You have three parts. You're made up of three parts. Why? Well, in Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our image. So we have that spirit just as God has a spirit. We have the body just as He sent the Son. And we have an eternal soul representing the Father. In John 15, I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit has a very unique role in your life. The Holy Spirit wants to help you. I often use the example, I'll say, you know, the Holy Spirit comes in at the moment that you get saved, and it's kind of like if I decided to move in. Uh, Brother Larry, I'm moving in. I hope you have a spare bedroom. I'm going to move in, and I was picking on him the other night, and uh, I said, uh, you got to get rid of all your, your rock and roll albums. And he said, all of them? And that's kind of what the Holy Spirit does, right? The Holy Spirit comes in, and he says, I'm here to help you. I'm here to lead you and guide you and encourage you and all these other things that go along with it. And then you know what he wants to do? He probably wants to paint the walls a little and clean up. Start changing things from the inside out. So the Holy Spirit is here as our helper to help us to learn to pray to God, to help us to learn to uh, understand the Bible. There are many roles that the Holy Spirit plays. He loves you. I mean, He is God, and He wants to be a part of your life. And if you love God and you're saved, you want the Holy Spirit to begin to take over and get more control over your life. And this is the struggle that every Christian has is how much room are you going to give the Holy Spirit? Brother Larry, I want the whole house. I want it all. I don't want you to keep me from anything. I want everything. And he's just saying, no, 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 you, you can have the closet, but you know, you're not getting the kitchen, all right? That's my kitchen. Isn't that typically what we do with God's presence? We kind of restrict, well, God, you know, I'll give you this area of my life because I know it was ruining me, but over here, I'm not ready for that yet. I'm still kind of holding on to this stuff. I want you to understand the Holy Spirit loves you. He is the spirit of love. The fruit is love and joy and peace, etc. Well, we'll have a whole sermon on the fruit real soon and the gifts. But today I just want to ask you, do you know the spirit of truth? Do you want to know more? Let's find out the unique role. You're in first, or John 15, right? Let's look at his unique role. Look at John 15, verse number 26. John 15, verse number 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Isn't that neat? The Holy Spirit's going to move into you once you're saved. So the Father, then Jesus says, I'm sending. So you believe on Jesus, then He sends the Holy Spirit to make His dwelling with you. Why? So that you can testify of the Lord Jesus Christ to other people. The Holy Spirit is there to help convert others. The Father sends the Spirit in the name of Jesus to teach us about Jesus and to teach others as well. It's interesting that the Holy Spirit cannot be seen. He is totally invisible, and yet the power of the Spirit of truth is undeniable. It's truly undeniable. Go to the next chapter. Go to John 16, please. John chapter 16. He indwells us at the moment that we are saved through faith in Jesus. And then it's forever. He's never going to leave. The question is, how much of the house, the tabernacle, are you going to give to Him? Are you going to fight Him every inch? Now, we're told that He seals us unto the day of redemption, so we're not going to lose that sealing of the Holy Spirit, if you will. We're told that He leads us into the truth and that He guides us. But I want to show you this, that He also convicts us of our sin. Look at John 16, look at verse number 8. And when He is come... He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness 
and of judgment. There are these three aspects of the Holy Spirit inside of you that God wants to use as you speak to a lost world. Number one, He's going to convict the world of their sin. He's going to reprove them, tell them that they're wrong. Now, it starts on the inside, by the way. That Holy Spirit's living inside of you. He's going to tell you you got something wrong you need to fix. And then He's going to lead you to tell others that without Christ they're on their way to hell. Verse number 10, he tells us, continuing, he said, oh, I'm sorry, verse number 9, it says, Of sin, because they believe not on me. Many times as we go out and we compel people as we've been commanded, and we persuade people as we've com been commanded, and we open the Scriptures and we allege that Jesus is the Christ, the very Son of God, and we show the Scriptures, some people will listen and they come to a point where they're just, I I'm not ready, I'm not ready. People will actually reject the gift of the gospel because they're stuck in their sin and they're not willing to give up their sin. It's very sad. Don't you know Jesus died for all of your sins? But the Holy Spirit inside of you, just sometimes, I had one time I was walking up to somebody's house with a Bible, and I, I carry a big Bible because I'm blind, you know? It's not because I, I want to beat somebody up with it. I want to be able to see it from all the way back here. And when I'm talking to you, I want you to be able to read it as well, right? I'm not one of these hide it in a, in a pocket Christian, you know, like, well, take the smallest one you can find. Don't let them know why you're coming. Surprise them. No, I don't believe in that. I don't want to, you know, I want you to know why I'm coming. I had this one guy, and you could see him looking through the window. He's looking at me, and then he looks at the Bible, and his eyes got real big. And then he, I don't want any of that. No, 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 I'm not answering the door. Go away. That Holy Spirit with you will convict others of their sin, and sometimes they reject you because of their own sin. He tells us in John 16, again, verse 9, of sin, because they believe not on me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. And then verse 11, he says, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Verse 13, this is important. How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself. Notice the humility in the Spirit of truth. But whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. I really believe I've met different people in, on a course in life where they begin to wake up that there is a new world order, a secret society. Revelation 13 tells us that there is a one world currency coming, a one world religion, a one world government, and there are people that discover these things and they're without Christ. And then they find out that the rulers of this world that are in spiritual darkness are literally worshiping the devil behind the scenes. And they say, oh my, if they're worshiping the devil, that must mean that Jesus is real. Sometimes when you start looking for the truth and you find out what's on the other side, it helps you ultimately come to the fact that Jesus is God. That Holy Spirit will help lead us to truth and guide us into the truth. That Spirit of truth, He will guide you into, notice it says, all truth. All truth. Too many times we want to do it our own way. Don't we? We're proud of man's accomplishments. Uh, I was recently speaking with an evangelist about a particular eschatological topic. And we were talking about some of the ins and the outs. And he says, well, that's very fascinating. I like that. I like what you showed me in that verse. What, what kind of book? Do you have a book on that? I said, I don't have a book. I've got like Revelation. That's a good one. That's a good place to start. Isn't it oftentimes that in our Christian doctrine... Well, let me, let me get a book. There's a book that a man wrote that explains what we have here. Why don't you just start here? Are you willing to throw all your books away and just read the Word of God and stand on what's clearly stated? Or do you come with this preconceived idea that, well, some man told me in his book that that's not what that means? Well, who wins? The Holy Spirit? The Holy Scriptures? The Word of God? Or some smart guy? I had a guy recently tell me, uh, he actually stopped outside here out of the church. He was riding his bike, and we were talking about things, and he had homeschooled his children. And he said, I, you know, my children are very intelligent. And he said, but I always said I would rather my children be ignorant than wicked. 
And if the world wants to look at my children as ignorant because I homeschooled them, I would rather them be ignorant than wicked. Because that is what the public school is serving up, is it not? Pure communism, Marxism, Satanism at the core, utter perversion. They're after our children. Here it says it will lead us into all truth. Verse 14, look at it. John 14, 16, verse 14. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. He's going to show us what Jesus has for us. I tell you, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray, doesn't He? He gives us utterance and He intercedes on behalf. Uh, if you will, go back to John 14. Go back a few pages. The Bible indicates that we pray to the Father through the Son, but we're doing it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And through this process, we see the unity in the Godhead, that all parts of God are in action. Some of the things I want to point out about the Holy Spirit as a person. He has a will. He has a will. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, it says, of the self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. He wants to give you spiritual gifts, and he, in his will, will give you what spiritual gifts you need. He also has a mind. Romans 8, 27, He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. The Holy Ghost has His mind. He has great knowledge. He has great knowledge. In fact, you're in, you're in John 14. Look at verse number 26. John 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in My name, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. What a beautiful promise. That's what James was saying earlier. The Bible says all. I believe all. Amen. When God says all, it means all. And I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit is going to give you all things that you need in that moment as you submit to Him and you're willing to minister as God has designed you to. Now that doesn't mean He's going to give you the winning lottery numbers, okay? All right. Maybe He will. I don't know. I don't think that's what that means. Maybe you have to go read a very liberal Bible translation to find that interpretation. When he speaks of all things, he's speaking of what Christ has given us in the Scriptures, the Word of God. We need to get it in our hearts so the Holy Spirit can then give it back out to somebody else. I often use the illustration like a computer. I can pull up all sorts of stuff on my computer, right? You know, now, if, I, if I'm not on the Internet, or if, how about this? If it's not on the Internet or on my hard drive, I can't pull it up. I can't, I can't produce that information. Well, this is our hard drive. This is our internet. Through the Holy Spirit, we're connected with God, and through His Scriptures, it's like our little hard drive, and it says, these are the facts that I know. And when the Holy Spirit wants to read your hard drive and spit out those verses, I, I challenge you, are you ready? Are you prepared? Do you have these verses committed to memory so that as we're commanded, you are filled with the Holy Spirit? Remember, that's where we started. You're commanded to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. He says... Whatsoever I have said unto you at the end of verse 26. That's his plan. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Go to Ephesians chapter number 4. The Holy Spirit can uh, speak through us. And that's exactly what he wants to do. In Acts 28 it says, Well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias the prophet unto our fathers. He says the Holy Spirit was speaking through Isaiah. The Holy Spirit has emotions. If you will, look at verse number 30. Look at verse number 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. I ask you, are you grieving the Holy Spirit? Are you causing God's Spirit of truth that's indwelling you, are you causing Him sorrow because of your disobedience? Go to Mark chapter 3. Go to Mark chapter 3. I want you to understand he has emotions. You know the Holy Spirit can be lied to. Did you know that? In Acts chapter 5 it says, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? I want you to understand the Holy Spirit is a person. He's inside of you. He wants to use you, but you have to submit to Him. You have to choose to give Him some more ground, if you will. Give Him some more room. Uh, submit yourself so that you can grow. The Holy Spirit can be 
quenched. If you're saved and He's inside of you, you can quench Him, right? Uh, that's like a fire when you throw a blanket on it or throw a water on it. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it says, uh, quench not the Spirit. He says, don't put out the fire that the Holy Spirit ignites in your heart. You know, the Holy Spirit wants to work through you to preach to other people. To be a witness, to be a testimony. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did on the very day that He resurrected. He breathed unto them and said, Receive ye, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they're remitted. Right away, He's saying, As my Father sent me, so send I you. Receive ye the Holy Ghost when He breathed on them. Now they have the power of the Holy Spirit. And He said, Go out and do everything that I've done. Go out and do what I've already shown you to do. And that's to preach the gospel. The problem is, many times, we don't give in to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Who's pulling who? Who's leading who? I give the illustration, my one, almost two-year-old, she loves to come and grab my finger and drag me along, and she'll go, yes, yes, and she'll point at something. She wants Daddy to see there's something here, right? And most of us Christians, the Holy Spirit's like a little toddler, doesn't have much power to move us. Whereas on the other hand, I have the power to grab her by the hand and pick her up and say, come with me. Listen, as Christians, we ought to be like that. So when we feel the leading of the Holy Spirit, we're like, carry me wherever you want. Take me wherever you want me to go. Use me in whatever way you want to use me. Now, we grieve the Holy Spirit. We don't do what He wants. We put that fire out. I had the opportunity recently, about a month ago, to preach the gospel to two friends. They had been friends for about 10 years, 15 years, as far as I can tell. They're both about 30, and they were, they were talking about some teenage stories they were doing. I felt the Holy Spirit leading me, guiding me, tugging me to preach to them, and I did. I preached the gospel to both of these men. One of them was sensitive to it. Yeah, I, I know I'm not going to heaven. Do you want to know? I, I do want to know. The other friend mocked me, blasphemed God, made a big deal about it. I ignored him, moved on from him, tried to dial in on the other guy. I want you to understand this. The Holy Spirit can be rejected by unbelievers. Acts 7.51, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. I remember that day because it was my birthday, and not that it was overly significant, but there's a, uh, another store down the road um, to make the story, the story short, and it's true. This guy goes to leave, and he's out there trying to crank up his motorcycle, the one that was blaspheming Christ, and in the flesh, initially, I'm like, yeah, it serves you right, buddy. But then again, that Holy Spirit started to prick my heart, and it's like, don't be mean to him. He needs help. About the time I'm going to walk out and help this guy, he needed a jump. Brother Chad and his family came through. There was a store down the way from where we're all working, and they were going to that store. And being my birthday, and because I had preached about chocolate chip cookies the day before, uh, Sister Alethea made some chocolate chip cookies. They brought me some as a gift. Really kind thing. Really awesome. But Brother Chad stopped and he looked at this guy's Harley. You remember? And he knew, oh, it's this. And Brother Chad, he's a motorhead. He knows all this stuff. And he helped him get it started. What a blessing. I knew this guy's stepdad. He wasn't there. I met his mom when she brought in a Harley part a few weeks later because he kept having problems with the Harley. This past week on Wednesday night about 8.30, he got in a motorcycle accident. He was not wearing a helmet. He ran into another vehicle. He flew. He landed. He skid about 75 feet. I really believe that sometimes God gives people a last chance. You've resisted me, you've rejected me, you've resisted me, you've rejected me. I'm still going to send somebody. And that man thought I was a fool for trusting in Christ. And he thought I was silly for trying to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified in a work environment to some big old tough looking biker. I did it out of love and it's not my love, it's supernatural love. 
It's the leading of the Holy Spirit that wanted to be a testimony to me. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. There are those that will reject the Holy Spirit. That man's in hell tonight as far as I know. You're in Mark chapter 3. I want you to understand this. The Holy Spirit can be blasphemed. He can be rejected. He can be grieved. He can be blasphemed. Now you can blaspheme the Father and you can blaspheme the Son. Jesus said those will be forgiven. You're in Mark chapter 3. Look at verse number 28 if you would. Mark 3 verse 28. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the Son of Men and blasphemies where wherewith soever they, they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. This is what's commonly called the unforgivable sin. But I'm going to tell you, there is no such thing as an unforgivable sin. Look, if you change the Bible at the end of the Bible, and in uh, Proverbs 30 and Deuteronomy, it tells us that uh, God's going to take your part out of the book. So you would just say that's an unforgivable sin? No, as it says here, this is an unforgivable man. Notice it says here, hath never forgiveness. This man has no forgiveness. The Lord Jesus Christ died for all of his sins. He knew him before he was formed in the womb gift of God, which is eternal life, has been offered to this man. And he rejected it, and he rejected it. It was his choice. Jesus said, if I be, be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And all means all, and Jesus has drawn him. But I thought blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was an unforgivable sin. No, it's the man that's unforgivable. It's the man taking the mark of the beast. Unforgivable sin. Well, actually, no, you're like signing your death warrant. You're crossing over and becoming a reprobate when you do that. It's not that that was the one sin that set you over. Every lie is worthy of death. Every murder, every fornication. We're imperfect people, and we need a perfect God. What is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, you say? Look at the next verse. It clearly defines it for us. Because, look at verse 30. Because... They said, He hath an unclean spirit. You understand that Jesus worked mighty powerful works through the Holy Spirit, evidenced in Him, and it was the Holy Spirit that was doing these mighty works, and they of the Pharisees said He had an unclean spirit. They said that He had a devil. What is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? That's to say when the Holy Spirit is doing something, you blame Satan. You give Satan credit for the work of the Holy Spirit. If you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to encourage you in this. The Holy Spirit is God. He is 100% God. He is eternal. In Hebrews chapter 9, it says, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit... I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong verse. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit... So the Holy Spirit is called the eternal Spirit. The Spirit of truth is called the eternal Spirit. You say, how long does that last? Well, since the beginning. Before God ever spoke heaven and earth into existence, the Spirit of God was there. He's called the eternal Spirit. He is eternal. He is omniscient. That means He is all-knowing. You're in 1 Corinthians 2. This is the verse I wanted to read to you. Look at verse number 10. 1 Corinthians 2, verse number 10. Please look at it. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit knows all things. He searches all things. He knows what you're thinking right now, whether it's things of the Lord, what we're talking about, or whether your mind is off somewhere else. What are we eating? What am I doing tomorrow? How's the weather? How's my garden? When can I get back to watching TV? Oh, God forbid. I hope that's not on your mind. <laughs> Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. The Holy Spirit is all-knowing. He's omniscient. In John 14, 26, I remind you, it said that the Holy Ghost, remember it says, shall teach you all things. He knows it all because He's God. 
He is omnipotent. That means He is all power. The Holy Spirit has the power to do whatever He wants. Now imagine this. A spirit is described like a wind. Uh, it, it is described like a force and a power, but yet it's a person. That Holy Spirit, I really believe, He can knock over a wall or stop a red light to protect you from killing yourself. He knows what you're thinking. He knows where you've been. He knows where you're going. He knows all things. If you have cancer in your body, I believe the Holy Spirit can see through the flesh, and He knows that. He's aware of it. He's omnipotent. In Acts 1.8 it says, But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. When the Holy Spirit comes on you in great power, I would say, let Him do what He wants to do. There's two, you know, I won't get into it greatly today, but the indwelling of the Holy Spirit happens at the moment you believe. It was introduced in John chapter 20, the day that Jesus Christ resurrected. That was the beginning of the new covenant. Everything was fulfilled. The death, the burial, the resurrection, that happened that Sunday morning that Jesus Christ arose and He breathed on them and He gave them the Holy Spirit as an indwelling. Now prior to that in the Old Testament, it's not like the Holy Spirit didn't exist. Even of Saul, the Spirit fell upon him and he prophesied mightily. The same thing happened to David. The same thing happened to Elijah and Isaiah and Ezekiel. Right? I mean, many men, the, the Spirit of God was speaking through them. So it's not that the Holy Spirit just started existing or started working through believers at that point. No, the Holy Spirit has always worked through the people of God. But this is different. The indwelling is that, uh, that form where He's never going to lead you, and He's there to lead you and guide you in a supernatural way to teach you the things of Jesus Christ and to be a witness to the lost and dying world. Now, when the Spirit falls upon you, as it did in the Old Testament, that still happens in the New Testament today. The indwelling was what Jesus Christ sent us from the Father when He resurrected from the grave. In 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance. I want you to understand this. The Holy Ghost inside of you will give you the power to do all things, and I mean whatever He wants to do with you. As much as you'll let Him, He'll give you great power. You're in 2 Timothy chapter 1. If you would, find verse number 7. Please look down at verse number 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. You understand the lost and dying world, they have a spirit of fear. They're afraid of everything. They're afraid of their eternal destiny. No, no, no. God has given us the spirit of power. God has given us the spirit of love. And God has given us of the spirit of a sound mind, so that we can do His will. If you will, go to Psalm 139. Go to the Old Testament, Psalms, chapter 139. Psalm 139. I remind you, the Spirit took part in creation, and He can do all things. He has all power. In Luke 1 it says, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. He was speaking to Mary. It says, for with God nothing shall be impossible. It says two verses later. With God nothing shall be impossible. I tell you, with the Holy Spirit in your life, as much as you'll give Him room, nothing is impossible. He gives you power to overcome. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He is literally everywhere. There is no part of His creation that He cannot go. You're in Psalm 139. Look at verse number 7. Look at verse number 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up unto heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings... Uh, uh, let me stop there. If I make my bed in, whole, in hell, behold, thou art there. I just want to correct some bad doctrine while we're here. Hell is not the separation of God. You could say hell is the separation from the love of God, but God's Spirit is there as eyewitness. God knows what's going on in hell. If you make your bed in hell, I'm still there as a witness against you. He says in verse 9, If I 
Take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. Wherever you go, there he is. All the more if you've trusted in him for salvation. If you've chosen to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he's promised you, I'm going to indwell you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm here to comfort you and guide you. That's God's promise. Do you believe him? Do you take him up on his promises? Do you know the spirit of truth? Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. We're almost done. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. I just want to tell you the, the Spirit of truth, God's Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, I have to say it, He is holy. <laughs> He's not unclean. He's not defiled or dirty or sinful or rebellious to go along with what Brother Chad touched on in Sunday school this morning. He is like that white garment. He's pure. He is the truth, right? It says in 1 John 5, it is the Spirit that beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. He is our life. In Romans 8 it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The Holy Spirit, He is wisdom. He gives us wisdom. He gives us spiritual talents and abilities and spiritual gifts for His glory, not our own. He is seen or recognized in our life by the spiritual fruit that we allow Him to work in our life. He helps us to pray. Here I want to show you that the Holy Spirit, He gave us the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 1, go to the end, look at verse 21. 2 Peter 1 verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. When the Spirit of God falls upon you to speak through you, don't grieve Him. Open up your mouth. Preach the Gospel. Let the Holy Spirit work through you. Go to Luke chapter 11, please. Luke chapter 11. The Holy Spirit wants to give us joy. He wants to give us peace. I tell you, a disobedient Christian has got to be one of the most miserable people in this whole world. A disobedient Christian has got... I mean, we think that the drunk in the gutter that can't quit, he, that's the miserable guy. The guy on drugs, the one that just can't stop, that the devil's got a, a, a stranglehold on his life, that's the most miserable guy. No, no, no. I believe it's the Christian that's rebellious and disobedient that has the Holy Spirit indwelling them and he's grieving God and rejecting God and God begins to punish them to get their attention because listen, sin is only fun for a season and then it comes home. Sometimes God will be long-suffering with you and patient and merciful and let you get away with some stuff that he does not prohibit. And then judgment comes. I believe some of the most miserable Christians are the rebellious ones that don't want to obey the Holy Spirit, that won't follow His leading and do what He says. Now, I just say this to encourage you. Don't quench the Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. He gives us those commandments. Don't put out the fire. Don't extinguish the Holy Spirit's work in your life. Don't disobey the leading of the Holy Spirit, especially when He convicts you of the sin in your life. Don't reject Him and allow yourself to be controlled by an, an unclean spirit, a strange spirit, a disobedient, sinful spirit. I'm going to warn you, there is a sin unto death. There are many Christians that crossed the line with God, and God took them home early. There are certain sins that God says, that's it, I'm done, I'm killing you, and you're coming home. Don't sin unto death. Don't rebel against the Holy Spirit. So here's the question. Do you know the Spirit of truth? So here's the question. How can I be filled with God's Holy Spirit so that I'm pleasing Him instead of grieving Him? You're in Luke chapter 11. If you would, look at verse number 13. Luke 11, how do we get filled with His spiritual joy? Verse number 13, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more 
Shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? How can I be filled with the Holy Spirit as I have commanded? Well, it starts by asking Him. Ask Him. Petition Him. Beg Him. All of you that have children know that there are some times, you, well, you go through the store and it's like, Daddy, Daddy, oh, I want that. Can I get this? I want that. Hey, do you ever go to God with that sort of an attitude? God, I want my joy back, Lord. Whatever it takes, will you fill me with the Holy Spirit? Will you give me that peace? Will you use me so that I'm fulfilling my purpose, my duty to you? Are you fired up? Are you after that blessing? If you would go to Colossians chapter 3, and we'll stop there. How do I get filled with the spiritual joy? Well, just ask Him, and then He'll begin to reveal some things to you, and He'll show you a path. But, you know, we need to get in the Word of God to hear from Him so we can bring it to our remembrance. We started in Ephesians 5 where it says, Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You've got to start by getting the devil's music out of your ear. You've got to get the Word of God in the form of memorization and song into your heart. That's why I love these old hymns. There is good doctrine in these hymns. It's glorifying God. You're in Colossians 3. Finally, look at verse number 30, or verse 16. Colossians 3, verse 16. <clears throat> Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I want you to understand, he starts out this verse by saying, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The Holy Spirit speaks to you through the word of God. When's the last time you got alone, carved out some time, and just said, God, talk to me, speak to me, show yourself, I want to hear from you. He says, come to the throne of grace boldly. And I'm telling you, come to the Word of God with all boldness and confidence that He'll answer you. You know, it's the Christian religion that has it right. And not all Christian religions, there are many that are false. The Catholics want to tell you about their popes and their councils, don't they? Well, 400 years ago, a bunch of us got together and we argued about something, and here's what we've decided. No, no, no. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. This is why a Bible-believing Baptist is not truly a Protestant. The Protestants protested the Pope, came out from the Pope. Many of them carried the baggage of baptizing babies and all the other junk. Even some of them believed in a Pope still. We're just going to have our own Pope. Same thing with the Mormons. Do they come to you speaking in the Bible? Well, sometimes they do, but then when you go, well, what's in the back of your Bible there? Oh, well, that's the book of Moses, and this is the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. We call it the inspired version. Why is it Mormon doctrine is based on something other than the Word of God? Seventh-day Adventists, they want to tell you about Ellen White, don't they? They want to tell you about how brilliant she was and how perfect of a life she lived, and they want to tell you about her writings. If you'll just read her then it will tell you how you're supposed to see the Bible. Rabbinic Judaism does the same thing today with many of their books. The Babylonian Talmud, the Mishnah, the Kabbalah. They say we interpret it through our external books. Calvinism says, well, what John Calvin said, he teaches us how to believe the Bible. Listen, I'm here to tell you, if you want the Holy Spirit to dominate your life, and to have joy in your life. Get rid of the outside influences and just stand on the Holy Word of God. The Holy Spirit is the author, and He's not the author of confusion. If you will, again, look at Colossians 3, verse 16. <clears throat> Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. 
God's Holy Spirit wants to work in your life, and the way that He can work the most is through the Word of God. Will you make time for the Holy Spirit this week? Do you know the Spirit of truth? If you say, well, yeah, I do. Well, then why don't you get back to the source and turn the TV off and turn the world's music off and get the rest of the cares and the distractions and the sports and anything else that would get in the way and submit yourself to Him. Yield your life and your mind to the Holy Spirit so that Christ can be glorified in your life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. I just pray that you would use these verses. I ask that you would help them to sink down in our heart. Lord, I pray that you would empower us through the Holy Spirit to see the truth. You are the only truth. God, I ask that you would get all the glory as we worship you in song now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.